Hi, I'm Connor. Welcome to Reviewing Every Game Small Indie Devs Have Sent Me, the show where I review every game small indie devs have sent me. I want to do this for a couple reasons. One, it gives me an excuse to play a bunch of games that I don't really have time for in my daily life, and I think it's important to show these devs some respect for their work and give them the exposure that I think they deserve. On today's docket, I have four games for you. Blackout Protocol, Deadeye Deepfake Simulacrum, North End Tower Defense, and Olgob the Bold. Since this is a review, I'll be giving you everything you need to know about these games, as well as some things that I think could be improvised if the developer is, by chance, watching. Let's get into it. First up, we're going to be covering Blackout Protocol. This is a top-down co-op roguelike released into early access on July 19th of 2023 by Ocean Drive Studio. Before I get into the game itself, there's a few quick things I'd like to note. First off is the fact that this studio actually sent me three codes for the game. Since the game is meant to be played in teams of three, they gave me three codes, which was just really cool. Uh, obviously, I use one of these codes and I give another to my brother, but I do have a third that I didn't use, so I'll be giving that one away and uh, more details on that at the end of the video. Regardless of the state of the game itself, I think it's important to point out the generosity of the studio. I'm really not that big of a creator, so you know, they didn't have to do that. This is also the first game I've been sent before it's actually released, so it was pretty neat for me to get a game with a review embargo on it, but let's go into the game itself. Ocean Drive Social Media Manager described this game to me as The Ascent meets Dead Cells, which caught my attention pretty quickly because The Ascent has been on my bucket list for a while, and what I've played of Dead Cells was pretty sweet. Uh, so basically, you pick one of four operatives of S2P, an organization that I imagine is sort of meant to mirror the SCP Foundation. You have the choice to play as Boy Scout, which is kind of the tank or bruiser of the group, Red, who is a firearm specialist, Scalpel, an assassin type class, or Beaker, who serves as a healer and was the main class that I played. As these characters, you're sent into Section 13, an S2P facility that has recently gone horribly awry. One thing I really loved was how the devs contextualized certain gameplay aspects into the world. For example, every character has a unique cutscene of them being called into action whenever you start a game. There's also an archive section in every character's area where you can see the permanent upgrade tree and guns you've unlocked for permanent use. On top of this, when you start a mission, your agent pulls up in a vehicle, pops the trunk, and that's how you select your starting loadout. All of these details aren't necessary, but they do make everything flow a little bit better. Speaking of the weapons, let's talk about them briefly. There are four departments of weapons. Red, which are firearms, and they're sort of just, you know, normal weapons basically, and it has five different choices. Psionic weapons are purple, and they're a sort of psychic or paranormal weapon type with three options. R&D is yellow and is meant to be experimental weaponry and currently has two weapons, and the bionic category, which is green, also has two weapons and are implied to be weapons utilizing extraterrestrial or like living parts. The combat isn't necessarily reinventing the wheel here, but it is fluid, well refined, and it's genuinely really fun. There are two damage types, physical and psionic. Most weapons deal physical damage, while some do psionic. Psionic deals damage to the little purple bar underneath, which is basically used to CC enemies. It's not as important, but you'll understand the more you play just how vital balancing these two weapon types are. The best thing this game has going for it is its atmosphere, but that's not to say it's the only thing going for it. In order to progress through the game and the levels, it's essential to understand how. Basically, enemies have a chance to drop these little blue cubes that you can use to purchase or upgrade permanent perks, things like reducing your roll cooldown or giving weapons a greater ammo capacity. You can only use this currency in safe rooms, so if you collect a bunch out in the field and die, you'll lose all the ones you gain during that run. During floors of section 13, you'll find various manners of equipment such as new weapons, upgraded versions of weapons you already have, ammo boxes or medkits, and extra tacticals like flashbangs, holograms, and various types of grenades. You'll also occasionally come across a type of upgrade called a nether cube that will give you enhancements during your run. There's a huge variety of these, so I don't necessarily feel the need to go into detail on these apart from saying that there's also four classes of these, same as the weapons. Like I said earlier, the best thing this game has going for it is the atmosphere. Each level of the facility has a very different look and feel, as well as enemy types, and I really enjoyed seeing how unique each floor was the further down I went. It really made me want to learn about the world that this whole thing takes place in, and the organization running Section 13, which is the best thing a game can do, make you want to learn about it. Speaking of learning about the lore and the world, this feels like a good point to get into the suggestions I have for the game. My biggest is that I want a place to learn about the world, like I said, so I think it would 
would serve really, really well in this game to add a sort of journal or diary in the archive section where players can learn about the different enemy types that they've encountered, as well as specific bosses or people and events mentioned. I was honestly very shocked when I went into this archive section and I found out this wasn't a feature in the game already. It would be best implemented with something other than walls of text, since that's what most lore dumps in games are, but I don't really have an idea for that. That's the only non-gameplay change I have in mind, so let's move into the other stuff. It's all pretty minor, but I think it could help the game as a whole. First off, definitely remove the nether cube timer. When you're picking enhancements for your character, it doesn't really make sense to force people to choose what enhancement they want in a certain amount of time, especially when they need to consider how that enhancement would fit into the rest of their build, or if they're a new player. I also think that the base movement speed should be increased. I felt kind of slow, especially until I got the roll cooldown upgrade, and I really don't like feeling slow in video games. Another way to solve this would be to add a toggleable mode that increases the speed of everything, from you to enemies to projectiles, sort of like the hyper mode in Vampire Survivors. There's also a fair bit of really co-op oriented enhancements that I think should be disabled from showing up when playing in solo. Speaking of enhancements, I think it would be fun to see some character-specific enhancements in the mix that show up depending on which class you're playing. Things like individual enhancements for uh, for Beaker, like the healer class, or, or for example, things that alter how Scalpel's ability works, you know, stuff like that. Maybe this does exist, but I didn't see any and I played a lot of this game. I think overall, Section 13's difficulty should be scaled down for solo players, at least on the first floor when you don't have as many upgrades. I genuinely felt sometimes like I was having an easier time solo on the second floor than the first, which was odd considering it's further into the game. It occasionally feels like there's nothing I could have done to prevent a death, whereas on subsequent floors it did feel like the result of a misplay on my part. It might have something to do with the size of some sections on the first floor being very small and hard to maneuver as a solo player with how many enemies there are. The developers have already addressed the issue of solo balance and have announced a dedicated solo mode, so everything about that is just what's in the game at this current time. Also, this one was huge for me, personally. Please put some sort of outline on enemies who are behind objects. Because of the camera angle, sometimes you'll just die to enemies that you have no idea are even there because they're behind objects and then when you start moving, they'll see you, they'll come kill you from behind, and like you won't know how like how that even happened. Uh, lastly, there's just one specific thing that I need buffing, which is the handgun. Uh, I get that it's meant to be like a starting secondary weapon, and like you're not really supposed to uh, like use it for the whole game. Um, but as of right now, there is no reason at all to use it. Even even like it just feels so useless. I think that what would really help it specifically is buffing its fire rate. Uh, currently, it not only is kind of useless, but it feels like shit, and I think that just increasing the fire rate would make it feel a lot better, even if you needed to lower the damage a bit to balance the whole thing out. Um, anyways, this section is stupidly long, so I'll just give you the TLDR. Is it worth the price? Currently, $13? Yes, I definitely think it is. Some of the reviews on Steam aren't all that great, but I do think this game is a lot better than those reviews are giving it credit for. You have to understand going into it that this is not a turn your brain off type of game. It's something you actually need to pay attention to and you need to take the challenge. But a lot of people seem to not understand that in the Steam reviews, which, you know, I didn't get. I've played a bit of solo and co-op, um, so I have experience with both. And I've really, really been loving this game, so I can't recommend it enough, even with its current problems. Uh, the devs have committed to a lot of really interesting stuff in the future down the line, but this section has gone on too long, so moving on. Next up is a game called Deadeye Deepfake Simulacrum. Before I played it, I had no idea what type of game this was, and uh, to be entirely honest, it looked kind of scary to me, and the email I got with my Steam code did not help. Putting aside the somewhat suspicious branding, <laughs> I decided to give the game a shot, and I must say I was pleasantly surprised. DDS, which is much easier to say than Deadeye Deepfake Simulacrum, is described as a top-down immersive sim developed by No Day Shall Erase You. Even at a glance, I'm sure this game looks extremely overwhelming to you, so I'll do my best to break it down real quick. So the middle box here on the left is the weapon that you have equipped, its damage, speed, and other stuff. Okay, I actually don't have a great idea of <laughs> what a lot of the stuff in this game means, but I'm gonna figure it out eventually. Uh, it also shows you the level of the weapon, cooldown between firing, reload speed, and the amount of ammo in your mag and reserves. Below that is your character box, which shows your speed, 
armor, slug, which is a resource used for slowing time. It also shows your level and ego, and I do not know what ego is, so whatever. Uh, below that box is your money, which you can use for a bunch of shit, which we'll talk about in a minute. Top right is a compass, which points you to your objective, and the bottom right is attack, which I'll be calling security, and it's basically how much the level wants to kill you right now. Below that is data, which is used for hacking. Speaking of hacking, let's talk about it. So when you press tab, you get this. If it wasn't overwhelming before, first of all, how, and second of all, good luck understanding this. All seriousness though, it's really not that bad. So where the data and security were is now a text box. This is used for hacking, which I will talk about more in a minute after you understand what you're looking at. Right above this text box are now just expanded boxes describing the security and your data. To the left of the box is your mission details and how to complete it. To the left of that is just a map that shows the objects and level that you've seen, which you can adjust by zooming in and out. What makes this game really unique is the hacking aspect of the game, which I mentioned before. It's not just a tacked on mechanic, and it's not really a side, it's a pretty significantly fleshed out portion of the game, and it's impossible to play without it. The tutorial does a pretty thorough job of explaining it, but I'll give you the cliff notes. So, once you press tab, it opens up a console. By inputting certain commands, you can take over just about any object in the level, from cameras to turrets to fucking toilets. There are a very large variety of commands that you can put in depending on the object you're interacting with. For example, if you hack into a toilet, you can spike it, which gives you vision of it anywhere on the map. From here, you can watch silently and wait for an enemy to cross the toilet's path, and when they least expect it, you can blow up the toilet. Literally. The hacking alone gives you so many really interesting options from a gameplay perspective, and I haven't even gotten into the other systems yet. To be entirely honest with you, I don't really know what's going on in this game's story. Um, I believe that it's something to do with a debt you have to pay due to an expensive medical procedure, but I'm not entirely sure. What I do know is that every time I arrive in my apartment, I get new emails from random people asking me to commit horrific acts of espionage on their behalf, paying me great sums to do so. With this money, you have a lot of options. You can pay your debt, or the cooler option, you can spend it on new weapons, whether that be new guns or, you know, big ass melee weapons. With each new email, the levels get larger, more complex, and much harder, but with a much larger reward. My favorite aspect of progression, though, are through a resource that you can find called chipsets. With chipsets, you can invest into abilities in your apartment's terminal from 15 different categories, which include Necromancer, Hacker, Esper, and a whole lot more. These wacky choices also have their own set of passive perks you can go for if you're looking for a nice little boost. What I loved so much from the time that I played this game is just how many choices I had. I get that's kind of the point of an immersive sim, but from a small developer and a very early access title, I wasn't expecting nearly as much depth as I got. It has a learning curve for sure, but if you're looking for something really chill to sink some time into, I do actually recommend this game. As far as improvements, the only thing that really bugged me while I was playing was how slow the gun rotated. I did get used to it, but it still kind of bothered me when I was playing. I'd also like to suggest adding some color or other visuals to the tutorial area and some of the earlier levels in general, as it did feel a little bland, especially for the first areas of the game. If possible, I think it would be really cool to get some apartment customization as well. If that's already in the game, then I'm stupid and I just missed it. Regardless, DDS has got some really, really interesting artistic choices, fully fleshed out mechanics, and phenomenal progression options. I might have gotten it for free, but for 13 bucks, hell yeah. Moving on, we have North End Tower Defense developed by North End Games. Admittedly, I was pretty disinterested when I first saw this one, not because of any marketing decisions made by the team, but because I'm only really engaged in tower defense games when they're mobile games. However, I actually had a pretty good time with this one. Like Bloons and other TD games, you have a select variety of units that you can use to fend off waves upon waves of enemies in either a level-based campaign or the endless mode. There are a ton of different towers, each with their own uses or specialties. Aside from the units, there are also powers that consume a secondary currency ranging from a simple barbed wire barricade to an airstrike or a patrolling tank. These abilities can completely change the tide of the battle, so be sure to use them when you get the chance. One thing that I liked a lot was the ability to use the commander. He serves as your main health pool, so if he dies, you lose. Fortunately, you're able to swap to him, launching rockets or sniper shots to have a more direct effect on the battles. There are also two types of progression, inside the battles and outside. 
Outside bubbles or free play or whatever, you can use HP, which is the currency you get from playing to purchase new units. Within levels, you're given options after each wave, I believe. These can be things such as upgrades to specific unit types or short-term rewards like extra coins for troops or even an artillery barrage. The game is pretty challenging, but it's a fairly unique game as far as tower defense goes. I'm also going to give a very brief shout out to the level design. It's strangely fantastic, honestly. Visually, they look great, and when you move your camera around past where it should be, there are actual things happening in the world. There's also little spots you can put troops outside your main safe zone, which I think is a neat touch and also kind of funny. As far as suggestions go, I do have a couple. Two of them are unit specific. The first of these two is regarding the cannon unit, which is spelled as the wrong type of cannon. <laughs> Um, and the second thing is just that I would maybe change the name of the Chinese crossbow unit because some people may take that as a bit offensive. Aside from those specific unit ideas, I only have a few more suggestions. First is that I would make it clear that you can rotate and move the camera during the tutorial. I was actually going to complain about some enemies just not being visible on the screen during levels until I accidentally moved the camera, so just a quick tooltip on the main menu or in the tutorial would help with that, I think. I think many players will also want the ability to zoom or unzoom the camera like I did, so unless that's another feature I missed, I would suggest adding that as well. Other than that, some of the vehicle animations can be a little wonky, like this, or this. It's not a huge deal, but it was a little distracting when I was playing. Uh, last thing, you'll probably be able to engage more players if you make more units available from the start. While it's fun to play with the things available at the beginning, it does get a little stale when you're constantly spamming the same three starting units. Either that, or increase HP gains overall. That's all for the suggestions, so do I recommend this game? I'm not really sure. It's fun and it's a good time, but I don't know if it's currently worth $8. There is a roadmap, however, so if you do want to check that out and decide if it'll be worth it down the line, I do encourage you to do so. The dev team seems very dedicated to this project, and I love the premise and the theme, so at least show them some support. Lastly, we have Olgob the Bold, the simplest yet arguably strangest of today's bunch. This section will not be super long, I don't think. Olgob is a Metroidvania slash Souls-like in which you play as an orc named Olgob attempting to overthrow a bunch of pop culture figures depicted as bears. Some of these bosses include, but are not limited to, Tetris, which is probably the single best boss fight in video game history, Khabib, the uh, UFC fighter, I guess, and Garfield, but like the scary one that people draw as a spider. Your objective, more or less, is to kill these bear lords, taking their power and giving it back to the oppressed people of the world, like uh, Robin Hood, but ridiculous. Upon starting, you only have a couple of tools at your disposal. Roll, attack, jump, parry, and then heal. While all of these are essential, you'll unlock a lot more options throughout the game that expand your moveset. The entirety of Old Gob's tools are pretty standard, but one thing I'd like to put the spotlight on is the bonk ability you unlock after getting the hammer. You can use this to propel you in any direction, and there are several sections in the game that utilize this to make for some really, really interesting platforming areas. These platforming sections are not my favorite part of the game, but they are a close second behind the bosses. Like I said, I wasn't looking to make this section super long, mainly because I don't have a whole lot to comment on, so let's just get into the suggestions. First of all, it is impossible to find where you're going in this game. Sometimes it's better than others, but most of the time it is so much harder than it needs to be, especially considering this is a 2D game. To remedy this, I'd recommend placing either markers around the levels or just cutting your losses and giving the player a map. Another option is to place NPCs around the levels or near bosses after you complete them that give you a sort of direction to the next objective, like, like loose instructions, you know, whatever. While we're on the topic of level design, I'd just like to say that it needs some work. I'm sure it's difficult to retroactively change such a large part of the game, so take it as advice for what you do in the future. Like most parts of this game, some are better than others, but some are also a whole lot worse than others. One of the best examples of this is right after the Tetris boss fight. Pretty much immediately following this fight is the longest individual hallway I've ever seen in a video game. I was walking left in a straight line for what felt like actual hours. At a certain point, I thought it was ironic, um, and I kind of just started laughing to myself. I felt insane. I felt like a fucking madman. With something like this, at least give the player something to look at, please. To top it off, as soon as I escaped this one-way hell tunnel, I got lost immediately and spent like 30 minutes trying to find where to go. Third, 
I think it would help immensely to add a visual of how many heals that you have left. I'm not really sure how the heal pool works, and maybe I'm just stupid or I missed the explanation, but in my experience it was very often a frantic guessing game as to when the triangle button on my controller was not going to work anymore, and that bothered me. This one's not a suggestion, I just wanted to point out that I got stuck on a wall once and had to kill myself. This one doesn't even bother me, really, I just thought it was funny, so I, uh, I threw it in here. Um, I couldn't even replicate it. Uh, like, I, I couldn't... I, I literally, I tried, and I could not get in the wall again, so, you know, whatever, it's not a big deal. Overall, should you play this game? If the developer hadn't added a boss mode, I would say no. The main game, in my experience, was fairly frustrating between the level design and, and whatnot, but every single boss in this game is so intriguing and bafflingly unique that I would absolutely pay $5 for the boss mode alone. So yeah, I think you should. Even though it's a little rough around the edges, it is a solo developed first project. So, you know, take it all with a grain of salt. Crab Juice, you have a really solid frame here and some fantastic ideas. So with that being said, I'm excited to see what you do next. Before I end this video, I did promise one thing. So let's talk about the Blackout Protocol giveaway. I'm gonna make it very simple for you all. All you have to do to enter the giveaway is to go to my Twitter that's linked in the description. You have to follow me, you have to follow Blackout Protocol's Twitter and retweet the giveaway tweet. Uh, in the interest of making this as fair as possible, I'll give it a few days before I randomly select a winner. Um, but yeah, anyways, I will see you there and good luck. That's really all I have for you guys today. Uh, if you're a developer or anyone at all, feel free to contact me via my business email in the description. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate it if you were to like, comment, and subscribe, because they'd all really help me out. Again, absolutely massive thank you to Ocean Drive Studios, No Day Shall Erase You, North End Games, and Crab Juice for sending me their games and being confident in their product. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.